keep going. Praise team this morning. They're um, tweeting Tammy still being out, and Josh was a little sick, so the Bingham's decided to stay home. So we're going to do some hymns this morning. So the first one's going to be "He Keeps Me Singing." So everybody, stand. Come on, if you can. If you can't, that's fine. But let's praise the Lord this morning. Hmm? Where is Ann? I don't know. No. But I'm not her. Almost you Four twenty-five.
bringing his Holy Spirit wind and just having a way. How many of you guys ever worked in the field out there, crossing tobacco or the hot field? Some of you, okay. Well, a lot from Iowa, something similar is uh, uh, it's called uh, just passing corn. So you would be out there all day in the hot sun. And I tell you, when uh, you're about to sway your brow, when that breeze would come, there's just nothing like it. And so maybe you come here today and you just need a breeze to blow over you uh, to help with the uh, scorching uh, wind from the trials of life. So if that's your case, I'm going to be praying for you. A lot of people are dealing with a lot of difficult things uh, this week, so I want to pray uh, over that at this time. But let's pray. God, we come here, uh, a lot of us from uh, different experiences, perhaps even from just even this morning, from an hour ago, or two hours ago. Maybe some have come here, Father, with uh, our restless night. Maybe different things that maybe no one even knows. Some of us, Father, may come here with family problems, um, where there's animosity, or perhaps our kids are uh, going in a way we, we never intended or never thought. Father, maybe we um, are having health problems this morning that um, seem to plague us and make it difficult to even get out of bed. Father, may we come here emotionally wrapped with difficult things or different things that we may struggle with that others may not be able to even relate to. Um, and so, Father, um, where will we come from this morning? Will you help still our hearts and just show us how to open our heart in a way that your Holy Spirit can blow upon it into our minds to be renewed by a gushing wind from heaven doors of heaven. Father, we desire to experience your presence, to have, to have an encounter with you. That's why we come to this place, Lord. Refresh us, Lord. Revive us. What your word says in Psalm 19, 7, that the instructions of the Lord are perfect and able to revive the soul. So, Father, come and revive us. Uh, before we move on, uh, Young at Heart, uh, we don't want you to miss that. That's going to happen May 11th at 10 o'clock. So be there. The guest speaker. Mm -hmm. OAM. Surprise. A big surprise for y'all. She said OAM. <laughs> OAM. All right. So you will not want to miss that as well. Um, and then the uh, enlistment committee, um, nominee committee. So um, we need to get you prayer over that for place of service. There's a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet for the young heart. And a sign-up sheet for the young heart. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, Mary, I got that wrong. Okay. <laughs> Please forgive me. Um, yes. Also, is there 25 strong people here this morning? 25. Let's just 25 strong members. 25 strong members. Only one. Okay. <laughs> We've got a lot to work on then. Uh, to Three, all right, well, we need 25, 25 strong members to show up at 5 o'clock tonight to attend a church council meeting, a business meeting, that's what I say, church, my best everything up, a church business meeting to cast your vote on a church sign that we have worked hard on, the church council has worked hard on uh, in proposing what we're about ready to propose uh, to you, uh, so we want you to be there, so if you're a strong, spiritually mature Christian, you see what I'm saying? You'll be there at that meeting. It's necessary that you be there. We, we can't vote or move forward if we don't have 25 for them. Denise. Uh, and also, there's a quarterly meeting for the um, Church of Science Report. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so I'll stand and worship the Lord some more. Hey, Cindy. <laughs> Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the ways you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, and in his or his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust his word and be patient. Have faith in God, he'll answer yet. Have faith in God, he's on the throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, though all else should be about you. Have truth in God, he provides for his own. He cannot fail, though the kingdom shall perish. He rules, he reigns upon his throne. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Amen.
Thank you, Leslie. Children's Church. Denise taking them. All right, Children's Church, if you have any children here with you, we'd love to uh, be able to disciple them, have the privilege of doing so. If they would go towards the back and be with Denise, and she'll take you to the rightful place. So I'm excited about continuing on through the book of John this morning. But before we do, I have a question. Um, how many of you here have ever been extremely frustrated with another person? <laughs> okay, well, um, how many of you have ever um, um, been a wife and uh, you've been, been thought, you explained something to your husband 16 times and you thought he should have got it by now and uh, he, he didn't get it? No, no ribbon, no, no elbows to the ribs right now. All right. Okay, <laughs> hand goes up. <laughs> John, not you. <laughs> well, we've all been frustrated uh, at times, haven't we? Um, you know, um, I, I know that uh, I know as many people probably when they tell jokes uh, to me that looks like it went right over my head, and I'm sure they get frustrated when I look like a deer in headlights. Uh, just know that it's not that I didn't get your joke. I just thought it was a dumb joke. No, no, no. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> okay. All right. You know, if you got, if y'all would get better at telling them, you know, like Rodney uh, Dangerfield here, I mean, right, we do, we, have, we do have a Rodney Dangerfield, a Rodney Dow House. We're very fortunate to have a Rodney Dangerfield in our midst. So you need to take his 101 tutorial on how to joke tell, right, Margaret? Because uh, he tells excellent jokes at home. So if you want to sit at the separate table underneath his wings and be discipled on being a good joke teller and a preacher, you need to get on with the sermon. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> but in all honesty, how many of you here have children? And when you had those children growing up, you felt like they were kind of dragging their feet and understanding something like, what don't you understand about cleaning your room after the fifth time? You know, after we taught you the last five years, right? That kind of thing. Um, you know, it's frustrating when people don't seem to understand you. Um, it can get very frustrating. Well, let me ask you the reverse. How, how many of you probably kind of have an idea that you might have been dragging behind a little bit at times with someone else. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about that in today's Bible story. So from Jesus' perspective on how the disciples, um, or this one in particular, was measuring up. So I could have easily titled today's sermon, um, Don't Be Caught Dragging Your Feet by the Time the Lord Comes to Your Street. Okay. Or, you know, um, God, had, God was ready to upgrade your faith last year. But know for sure today, God wants to upgrade your faith today. Wherever you are at, wherever you came through those doors this morning, wherever you're at in your faith, God wants you to go beyond where you are today. It doesn't matter how old you are or young, God wants you to go to another level. He has many levels prescribed for us before we're born that he would like for us to attain uh, to to arrive at. And so we're going to be taking a look at that this morning. Jesus had a, has expectations for us, a timetable on these different levels of growth. And so I want to encourage you to be thinking along those lines. Well, let's dig right into the scripture today. In John 3, 1 through 17, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Amen. Amen. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. 
Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Well, how can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak, and by the way, I believe we is talking about the Trinity. Jesus is referring to the triune God right here. We speak, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What a great context to those most famous verses in John 3, 16 and 17. Pray with me if you would. God, we, we come to pray. We ask that you would help us to open our hearts to at least one thing that you want us to grab a hold of and to have us be changed. God, we come to you and ask you to change us. For there's changes you want to have take place that we simply cannot change on our own. For instance, to be born again. No one can make themselves born again. This is simply a, a humble asking that we come to you seeking you to forgive us, to have mercy on us, to save us. That's what that means. And so, Father, if there's any here in our midst that has never been saved, never been forgiven, and they don't know if they're going to go to heaven when they die, may you make it clear to them that they simply, all they have to do is accept you with, by simply saying, Lord, I want you in my life. I want to have a relationship with you. And you will honor that by having them be born again. Thank you, God, for your offer. In your name we pray. Amen. Now listen, it's interesting in this verse when this Pharisee named Nicodemus came and he says, you know, uh, we know that no one could perform these signs or these miracles, in other words, unless they come from God. Now, what signs or miracles is Nicodemus referring to? Well, to give you a little textual context here, we know that we just talked about in previous weeks that the first miracle that Jesus did was the changing of um, water into wine. The miracle at Cana, we know, had happened. That was the first miracle that Jesus performed. And then we know last week when I upturned some tables out of the story of you know, to describe and show what Jesus was doing when he upturned those tables of those money changers. If you didn't catch it, in John 2, 23 to 24, it says, While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, Jesus performed many signs, and many came to believe in him. So during that time when he was upturning tables, when he was in Jerusalem, he was also performing many signs. It doesn't say how many, but he was performing many. And so people were watching these miracles, and by word of mouth, when they heard about that miracle at Canaan, people were amazed because... Jesus was doing things that they knew only God could do through a person. They couldn't do on their own. It wasn't magic. It was a miracle. And only a person from God could do this. Now listen, you need to understand a little cultural context in Nicodemus. I like giving a little cultural background because it helps shape and appreciate and give insight into the text itself more so. So I want you to know that Nicodemus was a very prominent person, a very prominent individual, a very prominent and respected individual. He was a ruler. He was a member of the ruling, this Jewish ruling council. He would be, I was thinking about this, he would be perhaps somewhat equal to, if you can imagine, our school superintendent. A lot of these school superintendents are also a member of NAS, N-A-S-S. That's the National Association of School Superintendents. And so they have um, a, lot of, a lot of power in being a superintendent and decisions that they make. Well, not only was he a ruler, this Jewish um, ruler of this council, he was a renowned teacher. He was a teacher of the law. In fact, Nicodemus would knew the scriptures like the back of his hand like you and I could never, ever probably attain. Because think about this. When, when Pharisees 
were being trained to be a Pharisee. In fact, when they were born into a Pharisee family, by the age of two, they took a scroll. I wish I had a scroll, you know, parchment today this morning with me. But they would take a scroll of the law, the Torah. They would put honey on it. And they would have that child lick the scroll so that their earliest memory would correspond with Psalm 119.103 that says, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. By the age of two. Check this out. By the age of four, they would start memorizing the book of Leviticus. An entire book. Can you imagine that? By the age of 12, they would have memorized Genesis through Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch. Those first five books. You know... um, I can't even remember the name of the strawberry farm field we picked strawberries at last night, let alone a short verse in the Bible or a chapter, you know. Um, and by the way, uh, it's interesting. How many of you here know where the shortest chapter in the book of Psalms is? Anybody know the shortest chapter in the book of Psalms? Well, I'm glad because I came to inform you. You know? What is it? Okay. The shortest chapter in the book of Psalms is Psalm 117. That's the shortest. She actually got the longest. You knew that's where I was going next. Yeah. Psalm 117, though, a lot of people don't realize that Psalm 117, if you go there, it's actually two short verses. Two short verses. FYI, you can go impress people now, how much you know your Bible. Psalm 117, two verses. Psalm 119 is the longest. It's 176 verses. Okay, and by the way, I do remember uh, the name of the strawberry farm I went picking last night. It was uh, Garner Farms, not Genesis Farms. Um, Garner Farms. That's where we went last night. But you know, I was thinking as we were picking strawberries there with uh, my twelve-year-old that we are a lot like plants, and God intended for us to grow and to ripe and to mature. And that's what He wants us today. He wants us to receive this invisible liquid, the Holy Spirit, to be filled with, so that we can grow, have the Spirit running through our spiritual veins, so to speak. Now, listen. By the time they were a teenager, they would go beyond memorizing the books from Genesis to um, Deuteronomy. They had to memorize the Psalms and the prophets. Not just those two short verses or the longest chapter we just talked about, but they had to memorize like the prophets like Hosea, minor prophets like Hosea, and major prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah. Can you imagine that? Now, a lot of you think, that seems impossible, Pastor. How many of you guys have heard of a guy named Tom Meyer? Tom Meyer is known today in today's world as the Bible memory man. Uh, Tom can recite from memory 20 complete books of the Bible, including the book, all 22 chapters of Revelation. And his first book that he memorized was the book of Jonah. And it, it, it all started because of a pastor challenged him to memorize a passage from the Sermon on the Mount. And he took him up on that challenge, and then God just took it even further. And by the way, he uh, has been invited to countless churches. In fact, as of count, he's been invited to over 500 churches to do this. And by the way, it takes him about an hour to recite the whole book of Revelation. That whole book of 22 chapters. And he travels in an RV across our country doing this and, and on display. And his wife also memorizes... Um, lots of portions of scripture, and he actually offers courses on Bible memorization at the Shasta Bible College in Redding, California. But his whole point now is to go out and to help, he hopes to rekindle this ancient tradition of oral transmission of scripture. If anything, I think it's interesting that he can prove that this was done back then. He does it now. In fact, he has a goal. He would love to memorize the whole Bible. But he believes that he may be too old because at the time of the article this was written, he's about 35 years of age. But the most requested book, by the way, in case you're wondering, is the book of Revelation. It's the most requested book to be recited with dramatization. He just doesn't recite it in a boring, monotone voice. He does it with dramatization. And he says that the book of Revelation is the the book of demand that most request. And he believes it's because of all the uncertainty of the world that we live in. And by the way, he's inspired many people, so much so that one teenage girl at one of the churches he went to has now memorized the entire book of Ruth. So I'm hoping here that um, Alyssa goes home and says, I'm going to memorize the book of Daniel. Just, no. <laughs> I'm just picking on you, Alyssa. You got it, Pastor. You got, hey, you got it! By next Wednesday, right? No, that may be a stretch. But you know, we, we cut, we, I think we sell our youth short. We sell ourselves short on what we really believe and think that we could do for the Lord. I really do. 
And I want to try to convince you, you know, with the Spirit's aid, that God has so much more in mind for you. Just new levels to ascend to and to attain and reach. Well, okay, we're going to go back on the, uh, back, get back on the rabbit trail or get off the rabbit trail or whatever. We're just going to get back on the trail here. Listen, if you chose to become a Pharisee, you had to publicly promise to take the yoke of the Torah. In other words, you had to vow to attach yourselves to the law of God. Also, they kept hours of prayer wherever they were. There was these set hours that they had to be engaged in prayer. Whether they be at the temple, they would keep their times of prayer. I don't know if it was 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. I don't know what those times were. But they did it at the marketplace or the street corner. And this helps shape the cultural background into verses like when Jesus said in Matthew 6, 16, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disfigure their faces so that people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they'll ever get. In other words, the praise of man. That's it. They won't get none in heaven. So they would do things like praying, praying. Um, you know, yelling at your voices a lot of times they would do, and, and, and they uh, would fast a lot of times. And, and by the way, they didn't just tie their money. I have a spice rack up here, if you look up here. They, um, they, have a, they, they wouldn't just tithe on their money, but they tithe on everything they had down to the herbs and their spices. Down to their spice rack. That'd be like me um, taking out a bay leaf here and then putting in the offering plate. Can you imagine me taking a portion out of all those spices and then giving? And then poor Denise has to sift through all the spices that everybody gave this morning. <laughs> I don't know all that was like back then. But just to give you an idea that they were very serious and devoted to the law. In fact, in fact, they were so serious and devoted to the law, they created additional laws that went beyond what Scripture mandated or commanded. They would create these additional laws called a hedge around the law, or they called them fence laws, so that people wouldn't even get close to breaking the law. Now, that could be a good intent if it's not done you know, in such a uh, legalistic way, but they, they did it in a wrong way. In fact, they created 39 laws to govern even types of work that were prohibited. So that no one would break the fourth commandment. For example, how, how many of you guys have heard of some of these fence laws? Check this out. Here's one of the fence laws. You could not spit on the Sabbath because it would disturb the dust on the ground and you would become guilty of plowing. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you could not swat a fly on the Sabbath because you would become guilty of hunting. John, I'll call you out. <laughs> right? A woman... A woman could not look at her reflection because she might see a gray hair and pluck it out, which would be defined as doing work. Yeah. Listen, they create loopholes to get around some of these laws. If your house was burning down on a Sabbath, you could not carry clothes out of it. However, you were permitted to put on several layers of clothes as the house was burning, and you could leave without breaking the law because you were wearing them instead of carrying them. Is that not absurd? <laughs> Listen. The sad truth is they're so busy teaching people these extra laws, they were killing people, misleading them, and converting them to the wrong things, to a false religion. Listen, on the Sabbath day, you could not travel more than three-fifths of a mile from your house. However, you could leave food three-fifths of a mile from your home on the night before, which would make it permissible to travel twice the distance without breaking the law. Listen, it's interesting that according to the Talmud, there were seven kinds of Pharisees. I don't have time to go through all those, but there was a Pharisee called the, the Shechemite Pharisee who kept the law for what he could profit from it. There was the bleeding Pharisee. The bleeding Pharisee was one who walked with his eyes closed in order not to see a woman, you know, to lust you know, upon a woman by looking. You know, and thus he received wounds by bumping into walls and, and possibly bleeding so that he wouldn't endanger himself of looking at a woman with lust. Can you imagine that? How about this one? The what am I yet to do Pharisee. The what am I yet to do Pharisee was one who, as soon as he had done one of the commandments, he would ask, what is my duty now? And I will do it. And that gives you context to this, uh, this cultural custom of this Pharisee. Gives great insight to Matthew 19, 16 through 20. You know the one where the rich young ruler came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to earn eternal life, to have eternal life? Okay, then there was a Pharisee, um, an out of fear Pharisee, a Pharisee that he kept the law because of his fear, afraid of future judgment with God. Then there's the Pharisee out of love. 
which we believe Nicodemus fell in this category. The Pharisee out of love uh, would have been one who obeyed the Lord because he simply loved God with all his heart. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were believed to be in this group. Now, the common law, the common, I mean, the common Jew, the reason I bring all this up is because the common Jews of their time, they looked at Pharisees with the greatest admiration because no one appeared to be more dedicated to God than this bunch of people. And so that gives background and shape into this person, Nicodemus, that is coming here because Jesus is about to turn things on its head on what Nicodemus was able to attain with all his scripture memory and knowledge and what is about ready to go on here because of their dedication to God's law and all the time they spent memorizing it. They should have been the first group to recognize the Savior when he was on the scene and to embrace the Savior and why he came and to recognize that this is the promised Messiah indeed. And to fall upon their knees when they see him in the appearing of the flesh. And so when Jesus donned his face here to Nicodemus, what should have happened should have been a scene right out of the song that Doris Troy sang in 1963 called Just One Look. Y'all know that song, Just One Look? For those of you, I tried to go back to the 60s here to help you here. Listen, Just One Look and I Fell So Hard in Love with You. I found out how good it feels to have your love. I thought I was dreaming, but I was wrong. Ah, but I'm going to keep on scheming till I make you make you my own. You know, that's what they, they should have been. They should have had the approach that I would do all I can to all scheme and try to be as creative as I can to show how much I love you, God, and to honor you. And, but instead, the Pharisees were the most aggressive people that were scheming the wrong way. They were scheming to attack him, and they were at war with Jesus. In fact, if you were to remove a lot of the dialogue between the Pharisees and Jesus, you'd have a lot of the Gospels removed. And that's sad commentary, folks. And so we want to be careful not to become like this group of people. But I believe Nicodemus was a bit different, but he still was lacking in his understanding of who Jesus was and why he came. Because when he says in verse 3, Verily I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus tells him this, and Nicodemus is stumped. He says, how can a person be born a second time? Well, you're gonna have, are you saying you've got to stuff me back in my mother's womb at this age and this size in order to have this, this happen? He's trying to figure it out. And, and, you know, and honestly, to defend Nicodemus, how many of you, I, I, I put myself there, if I would have heard this concept called being born again, I would have been probably right where Nicodemus was. I really would. I've been like, born again? What are you talking about? That makes no sense. But Jesus is not unreasonable, and he's not cruel. He's not mean by having an expectation that by this point in his faith and his life, he should have understood where Jesus was at. And that's why Jesus says here, um, I'm going to show you that Jesus has a bar. Jesus has a bar for us. Now listen, when I say Jesus has a bar, I don't mean that Jesus owns a bar like the one here in Newburn called Halftime Pub and Grub. And no, I have not been there. Okay, I just, I just looked what up, looked up a local bar, and I'm not condemning him, but I'm just saying he, that's not what I mean by bar. What I mean by bar is Jesus has a timetable of expectations for every person here on what level of spiritual growth, by what point in time, what age, and when they should arrive there. And so he has this bar, this expectation that we should meet and that we, there should be this growth chart. You know how many of you had the, in your closet or somewhere in your house, you measured your kids every year and showed them how tall they were getting and going? God has that same thing on the walls of heaven, by the way. He has expectation that we should reach a certain height. I'm not talking about, you know, physical height. I'm, I'm talking about spiritual height. That he has a plan. And he wants you to, to see where you are today and see if it measures up. Because he has expectations of how far our faith should ascend by the time we die, by the time we ascend into heaven. And so you can think of the word bar as barometer. And we all have this. We have this for our children, do we not? By a certain age, we expect them. Right? You know, Maybe by the age of five, you expect your kids to make their bed. Maybe by the time they're age eight, you understand that they understand there's severe consequences for talking back. Right? There's certain expectations that we have. Is it not reasonable? Is that not reasonable? The kids should be taught that today's world, by the way, not to be disrespectful. Maybe we lost that one. I don't know. Anyway, we, um, you know, and by the time at age 10, how many of you expected your kids to know calculus three, right? Isn't that reasonable, right? Calc one, two, and three. I had those in college. That's why I'm no longer in math or a math teacher, and I did not stay at that major. Um, 
I had enough of calc uh, for a lifetime. Anyway, no, I say that to be funny because Jesus doesn't have that kind of expectation of us. He doesn't expect us to know calc three by the age of three. His expectations, we need to understand this axiom that I'm about to tell you, and this is a spiritual axiom here. You need to understand that Jesus' expectations and his timelines are never unreasonable. Okay, I, you need to understand this when, before we go into this. Because I want to look at um, verse 10 here, what Jesus says. Can we put verse 10? You are Israel's teacher. This comes fresh on the hills of Jesus telling him the, the number one thing we have to do to get into heaven. He says, you've got to be born again. And he says this. He says, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. The implication is what? You should understand this. All the scriptures that you've amassed... You should understand where I'm at, where we're going with this. You should understand this. Again, Jesus is not mean. He's not cruel. He's not unreasonable. Let's look at verse 7 to bolster this bar. He bolstered the bar by again saying and earlier, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So not only is he saying, you should understand this, you shouldn't even be surprised by this. Now, how many of you, if Jesus explained that back then, would have been surprised? I, I probably would have been. I'm much in the category of doubting Thomas, I, and it's to my fault, not to God's fault. But in my own life, I have been dragging behind a lot in my spiritual life. But Jesus has caught me up quick once I give him my heart and, and I'm ready to go. But the implication here is this. Jesus is saying this. Let me give it in the modern-day jargon or vernacular. Why are you dragging your feet here? Why are you dragging your feet on this? Because he should have known from Genesis to all those books that he memorized, he should have known that this coming Savior was going to be a Savior from his sins. And that he would need this. And that Jesus would uh, have him understand that when he's making this connection with being born again to the kingdom of God, he would have known from all the Old Testament verses and all the pointing that salvation from sin was going to happen by way of a Savior. He would, have, he would have known that. And when Christ introduces this born-again concept and he links it to the Jewish expectations of this coming kingdom of God, then Nicodemus had enough knowledge to figure out the riddle that Jesus expected him to have this figured out. That salvation means being born again. To be saved from our sins. It means to be born again. Just as our first birth is necessary for physical life to occur, a second birth is required for this new spiritual life in God to occur. We have to have God's Spirit come in us to save us. And we can't do that. It's simply us coming to God, asking Him to do this, something we can't do on our own. And this happens at the time of our salvation. And this salvation is what changes us. And when we're changed, that's when Christ kingdom is ushered in and then we see the kingdom of God now we see things anew we understand now the things of God the Holy Spirit makes it clear to us and that we're willing to come under his authority the one who reigns the kingdom think about this tell me this why would God let someone into heaven that does not want to be under the authority of Christ the one who's ruling heaven now because how many times do we hear about people all the time saying oh well, they're in heaven now you know I mean everybody everybody's in heaven now according to the world you know much of the world anyway right well, they're in a better place, right? But I always want to say, well, I don't know. If they don't know Christ, I, I can say they're not in heaven. If they know Christ, then they are in heaven. But that's an offensive teaching, and Jesus told us the gospel will be offensive. But listen, God's offended by the world's gospel. The gospel that says you don't need to do anything or, be, you know, or receive any faith. You don't need Christ. Then that means Christ died in vain, and Paul says that. So we don't need Jesus to die on a cross if there's any way to heaven, right? That's offensive to God. That's offensive to the Son and what He came to do and pay for us. And so we need to understand at the end of the day that why in the world would somebody live all their life rejecting Christ to the time they die, rejecting Christ their whole life, rejecting this offer of salvation, and then all of a sudden they mysteriously they're just put in heaven by God, even though all their whole life they were unwilling to be uncome to His authority and His rule and reign. All of a sudden I'm to believe that they go to heaven and they all of a sudden want to be under God's rule and reign and His authority? No, you're a rebel on earth. You will be, want to be a rebel the next life. And there's a place for those rebels. And it's not heaven. It's a place called hell. But I understand it's not politically correct. And by the way, God's not into politically correctness all the time, we think, right? He's not. Especially if it's defense, especially if it's the gospel. And so I say a lot of things that are not politically correct when I say these things. But I don't care. I'm not afraid of that. I'd rather please God than be a man pleaser. Because I have to answer to God at the end of the day. And so do you. 
And what you believe and what you tout are supposed to be touting. And God's given me the authority to do this. I have authority. He's been, in fact, he's given me the responsibility and the commission and the command to do what I'm doing today. To affirm you that if you are not born again today, you will not go into heaven. That's the truth of God. And you need to hear that. And you need to know that. And we need to tell others that. You know, in a certain way. Depending on where people are. I understand that. Right? Sometimes we don't go for the gusto the first time we meet someone. Right. We have to be spiritually discerning. We've got to be led by the Spirit. We've got to be flowing with the Spirit. Walking with the Spirit. Abiding in the Spirit. That's what we are to do. But listen, I'm here to tell you, unlike the title of the movie, not all dogs go to heaven. Because listen, we're, we're all dogs before we meet Christ. Our righteousness is filthy as rags. But praise God, He can clean us up because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And He can save us. Listen, there's no plan B, folks. There's no plan B. There's only plan A, and that's accepting Christ as our Savior. That's it. That's the only plan that God has given us to know that we're saved. And we need to understand that. We have to forego our pride, folks, to get in. That's the bottom line. You've got to forego your pride. Listen, no one without Jesus goes to heaven. Is that clear? I don't know if I'm being clear. Does that, does that make sense? Today, I'm not sure in today's world. But no one goes to heaven unless you have Christ. Amen. No one goes to heaven unless you have Christ, folks. That's it. I hope they see it on YouTube. I hope, they, I hope, <laughs> I hope people I know that that's what we preach here. That's, that's what we preach here. And I'm gonna, I, I just preach what Jesus preaches. Amen. It's not my teaching. It's Jesus' teaching. I know people can go for the juggler and say, well, how do we know what Jesus taught was true? Because men preserved, you know, those were men that wrote scripture and men are fallible. Well, that's true, but so are you. <laughs> In other words, am I to think that God doesn't love me enough to preserve scriptures all through time? That he has the ability to keep the integrity of scriptures intact and the doctrines to teach us to let us know truth all through time? Or does he want me to depend on that person talking to me saying, no, oh, you're right. I'm going to believe you and your truth rather than my truth because you, who's also fallible, for some reason you got it all together and you're are touting the truth that I need to know, right? Does that make sense? Well, people are just as fallible, you know? They're more fallible because men that wrote scriptures were moved as the Holy Spirit moved their pen, okay? We know scripture says that. So the expression born again simply means born from above. And see, Jesus created this capacity to be saved. I didn't. I just give the authority to preach it. Listen, here's the bottom line. If we don't understand this basic principle of salvation this morning about being born again, how on earth can we move on to other kingdom matters and to go beyond that? Does that make sense? You're not, you're not ready. In fact, let's look at verse 12 here again. Jesus says in verse 12 here, check this out. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Again, there is an expectation here. He's saying this born-again stuff, this salvation stuff that you should have down pat by now, but you don't. Um, how can we move on to other kingdom matters or understanding other concepts of kingdom life, right? He said, you have to have this down. And how many of us, honestly, if you're not secure in your salvation, why would you want to tell others that, how to be saved when you're not sure how yourself? You understand? And by the way, when I first read this, I was thinking... Well, this born again matter would seem more like heavenly stuff, God, not earthly. <laughs> you know, that's, that seems like heavenly stuff. And it is in a sense. But he's talking about, listen, don't, don't leave earth without it, okay? Listen, there is an expectation that God has for us by certain ages. If we've heard the gospel over and over and over again, and we've been in church for years, he was expecting you to get saved a long time ago, but praise God, you're still alive, you still have breath, you can still receive him, it's not too late. That's how merciful God is to keep you alive. I, I still have to say, we can't lead people to Christ and disciple them if we're not saved ourselves, or if we've never been discipled ourselves. Listen, I say this, that when I first accepted the Lord, when I was about five years of age in my living room, I was going to a, a church, a small church in Dallas City, Illinois, a town, you know, roughly around 500, or maybe a little more. But I didn't receive Christ at the church. It was at home. The Holy Spirit came to the living room, made it very clear to me and to my heart what had to happen. And there was no refusal at all. I, I let the Spirit come and usher in. I, and I experienced the most incredible sensation in my entire life. And I've never forgot it. It's changed me for my life and for all of eternity. Does that mean I came a perfect person? No, not at all. In fact, that's why I bring this up. I was in church from age 5 to about 18, 19 in college. And from those 15, 16 years, 
of my life, even though I was going to a, a Methodist church, uh, a Christian church, I was, I was raised in church, I was never truly a disciple. And that's sad to say that. that. I did not know anything about the spiritual disciplines. I didn't know about having this daily walk with God, daily prayer and memorizing scripture. It wasn't until college that a young man named John, in fact, I tell people now, I tell people, I went to the college I went to because I was recruited to run track and field. I was recruited to run the foreign hurdles. I, in other words, now God's told me, showed me the bigger picture. He made me fast enough so that I could get discipled by a guy who was waiting in the wings to show me what really mattered in life, what was really important, even more than running track and field. And now I run a different track. Does that make sense? But I'm able to run that track now. I wasn't before. I wasn't running. I was living like the rest of the world. I was running with the world. My life was no different. It wasn't much different at all. Until God hit me like with a two by four. This verse in Hebrews 5.12, I'll never forget it in college. It says, by this time you ought to be teachers. Again, expectation timetable. By this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. In other words, they had received it. But they hadn't really received it. I wonder how many of us are dull-minded or dull-hearted that we've heard it, but we've not really gotten it, if you know what I mean. And there's a big, big gap between the head and the heart, folks. Listen, I, I wasn't doing things like sharing my faith. This guy, he knew scriptures. He knew the Bible like the back of his hand. I knew very little scriptures except for John 3, 16. Listen, he was sharing his faith, and I began to think, you know, he was wanting to take me around the college campus and have me share my faith and evangelize, and I said, that, that seems uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, you actually kind of have to believe people would go to hell, I think, to want to teach that. And the Bible says, exactly. And so I began, you know, to stumble and bum my way, but, I, but because I had a heart still for God that was put there a long time ago, it just wasn't developed. It just wasn't matured. But God took that. And he began to run with it when I began to give him more of my heart. And I began to share. And fast forward, then I, I, I heard about this, you know, about seminary. And so he got me on the fast track to growth, to get me caught back up to where I need to be. And so when I was working at UPS on Atlantic Avenue in Raleigh, I, I led three people to the Lord because I was taking this evangelism class back at seminary that they required you to share at least your faith one time each week. We should, we should make that mandatory here, John. Share your faith one time. Or we're going to do something, right? You're going to take him out hunting. <laughs> no, I <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we want a different kind of hunting. We are, right? We're to be fishers of men, that kind of hunting, okay? Listen, I'm saying this. I wasn't caught up, but now it's a part of my life. It's part of my lifestyle. I mean, just recently, I believe I need to practice what I preach. And so I need to be held accountable. So I, I, this past week, I, I've shared, I invited people to, to church. Um, as a waitress at IHOP that I, I got to talk to and, and talk to her about God's love for her. That God wants a relationship with her, you know? The question is, you know, does she want one with God? You know, that's the bottom line. The, we have a merry maid service that provides a service here, cleaning service for our church. I shared the gospel with her. I gave her tracks. So in case she didn't understand me the first time, I gave her a track that's got Duck's Dynasty explanation of the gospel very clearly that she could take with her and, and take to her uh, boyfriend and, and son that she's got. And so anyway, um, listen. After salvation, there are so many more lessons God wants us to learn. There's so many more levels of faith. Jesus says in John 16, 12, he says, he says this to his disciples. I have many things to say to you. He didn't say a few things. There's a few little bit more things I'm going to throw in there. No, he says, I have many things to say to you, but what? But you are not able to bear them now. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. Listen, I want to give you a little Christianity 201, because I think you're all ready for that at least, right? 201. Here it is, because some people aren't even getting this. I, our people, our Christians, our disciples that come here to this church need to understand something. We need to get this down, down pat. I want you to get this down pat before you leave. Write this down. Listen, because there's a lot of Christians out there like the Pharisees. And when I say that, I say this. They're proud to know God's word. In fact, they love God's word to a fault. They love God's word more than they love people. You know, you can be a Christian and be guilty of that. You can amass scriptures and know scriptures like the back of your hand, but not have a lick of ounce of love for your family or your friends or other people. I say that. Listen, you can know scriptures like the back of your hand. I don't care if you know Spurgeon, Luther, Calvin, the Reformist, the Reformationist. I don't, I, don't, I don't care how much scripture you know. If you don't love people, then you don't love God. Listen, I think that we live in a day and age when people are ignorant on how they hurt people. I'm just going to say it. 
I think we're, we lack self-awareness. I think we live life in such a way we don't even realize when we're hurting people. I know from just talking with people week after week, and week after week, week after week, there are families. There are people in families where the relationships are torn because people that are Christians, claiming Christians that know the Word of God like very few, but will never tell other people in their family, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Because of pride. Did you know that? Listen, I've worked with that. I've worked on church staffs. I've been at churches. I've worked with pastors. I have a pastor who shared with me. He was at tons of churches. And this one pastor he worked with, it was under, it was mean-spirited to him. And never once asked him in the time that he worked with him, will you forgive me? I, I've, I've wronged you. I'm really sorry. I wronged you. Not one time. But the crazy thing was, this person telling me this had done the same thing to me. For a decade, never once said they were sorry when I was hurt a lot by this person and it would even bring it to their attention. Listen, we got to stop living in a world where dogs are nicer than people because we're not even being like dogs. <laughs> that's, where, hey, that's being worse than dogs, by the way. Listen, I'm not here to cut us down or, or tear us down, but I read these things in the paper all the time. Listen, don't be fooled. You might love God's word, but you don't love God. God, if you never give another Christian a time of day, or another person for that matter. Listen, if you never respond to their text in practical application. Listen, I was, I was reading Dear Abby, and this mother was hurt. She had a son, an only son, and she was getting to know some of these other women that had other children, and they seemed to get along, so they seemed to be friends. But when she would text them and say, hey, does your kids want a play date with my kid? They would never respond. A simple question, they would never respond. And she asked dear Abby, bless her heart, she asked dear Abby, she said, am I doing something wrong? Am I being too pushy? Am I too clingy? Am I doing anything wrong? And dear Abby says, no, you're not doing nothing wrong. That's simply mean and rude by not responding. Listen, people text you and ask a question, respond. Just respond. Don't let a month go by. Oh, I didn't, you know, I just pulled up your text from three years ago. Um, listen, we don't want to become a bunch of Christians majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. Otherwise, you'll get a bad haircut. What? Oh, yeah, I, I, I literally mean that. I, you know, last week I shared with you, I, I got, I'm sporting this new, uh, or last week I was, sporting this new Puerto Rican Ricky, right? Haircut, that's the name of the haircut. I, well, I, yesterday I had to go to Fantastic Sam's to repair that work, to repair that damage. <laughs> I thought maybe I'd be in and out five minutes and you know, it'd be like five bucks. That wouldn't cost. No, I got fully charged. <laughs> it took a long time. I guess it was that bad. <laughs> but I was telling her some things I didn't tell you last week. I'm very transparent here. So um, anyway, um, I know not telling you where I went, but, you know, because some people are like, well, I want to know because I don't want to go there. Anyway, but they spent, the person spent about 45 minutes on the hairs of my ear, spent more time on my ear hairs than my head hairs. I kid you not. They're very meticulous. I don't know if they, they're teaching that now in uh, beautician schools or cosmetology schools, but yeah, they had this little thing you could still suck in and just make sure you got every single hair. And I thought, well, that's great. That's very meticulous. Listen, I say a lot to say we can become like the Pharisees if we're not careful, and we can know every law, every rule, every little deed, every little thing, have it, but we could be cutting the wrong hairs and spending too much time, and we're actually out there sporting a bad haircut. We can go out there looking like buffoons as Christians, y'all. Listen. God gives us this razor, the Holy Spirit, to cut things out of our life, to cut the right things out of our life. Not to have us use that weapon, the scriptures, as a tool to beat people up because we end up sporting a bad hairdo is all I'm saying. So don't leave here today sporting a bad hairdo. All right. Listen, I close with saying this. I want to speak of some earthly things like Jesus did here are some steps to think about where you're at before we go. Where are you at in your level of faith? First of all, are you saved? That's the first level of faith. That's the entrance level. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be saved. You have to invite Christ as your Savior. The next thing you need to do, the next level is being baptized. You know, we've recently had a, a baptism here. You know, Cassidy got baptized here. You know, friends of the family here, baptized. The next thing, and I told her, uh, you need to join a church somewhere. It don't have to be here, but you need to join a church, a local body of believers that you can be held accountable and you can be getting the scriptures and teaching of God's word in Christianity 101. You can know how to upgrade your faith. 
Okay, but you need to join a church. Next thing, next level is you need to learn and utilize the spiritual disciplines. If you don't know what those are, then you need to either come on Wednesday nights where you're getting in the Word. I call it a small group, time of discipleship. But you need to begin to learn and utilize the spiritual disciplines and learn and utilize the spiritual gifts at that local church that you're part of. So you need to serve and use your gifts. And that comes at the right time because Mary Tyson's the head of the nominating enlistment committee. And so what a great time to learn these things. Listen, I have a goal. I don't know if it's realistic or reasonable, but I would like to see next year 30% of our people in some kind of small group, whether it be Wednesday night Bible study or some small groups that we're launching. We've already launched one. We've been going pretty good on Sunday evenings um, with some core people here. But you need to be either being discipled or discipling others. You need to be involved in both, but at least do one of them, okay? Um, well, I guess you got to kind of be discipled if you're discipling others. Anyway, um, but it's interesting that there's different levels of our faith. We need to grow in being a God pleaser instead of a people pleaser. We need to go from being defensive and defend the gospel. We need to stop being easily offended and become easily um, taught and obedient. We need to stop worrying about whether God's going to daily provide for us. We need to move beyond the level of worrying about everything in life. Does that make sense? We have to move beyond those things to get to, to new things. I was thinking about even deeper things. For example, when I, as I come to a close, listen, we need to, the Bible says, seek out spiritual gifts, like the gift of prophecy. That's a whole nother level, folks, that many may never even reach to. The, for, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, let love be your highest goal. And he goes on and says, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. That's scripture. So there's different levels that we can go. And hearing God speak, on, on these things. Listen, I'm going to get really crazy by saying it's even possible. I know this is going to freak a lot of people out when I say this, but it's actually biblical. But I don't know why us American Christians, we're just kind of left field on some things. But there's even a level of being able to cast out demons. Well, I know. Wait a minute. Before, you, before you're ready to throw stones, check this out. I know what you're thinking. Pastor Kevin, Jesus casted all the demons out. So demons no longer exist. Right? We have no demons in America. The border is up. We have borders for those things. Demons don't cross our borders, right? <laughs> we have a lot of demons. <laughs> Listen, they weren't magically, mysteriously exterminated. And people had to learn to do that. In fact, it's interesting that one of the first frustrations that Jesus, I believe, had with the disciples, and they had, was in this spiritual warfare. Because... It says the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? It's talking about a demon, right? And Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, this, this kind requires mustard seed faith, right? You can say this mountain, move from here so there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. And he, and he actually gives an indictment. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Other translations say faithless, corrupt, twisted. And what you got all wrong, you're... Listen, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Can you sense frustration? We don't want a faith that frustrates God. Listen, I'm not saying I'm going to offer a demon casting out 101 next week. I'm not, but you hear me out. There's a, there, but there are levels that we need to get to and move beyond You know what Peter Scazzaro, um, who says there are seven marks of a healthy discipleship, and one of them is this. Follow the crucified, not the Americanized Jesus. At some point, you have to come to your level of faith and say, enough's enough. I can feel something's not right. I'm coming stale. I'm feeling dull. I'm feeling empty. I am willing to die before I stay put at this current level I'm at. You have to come to that radical decision and choice in your life and say, I can't live in this level anymore. I've got to go beyond. I've got to move on. I can't stay here. If you come to that place, you're right in the square of where God wants you to be. That's where God wants you to be. I'm not afraid to tell you that. I got one short life. I don't know about you, but I got one short life. Listen, YOLO is the big common thing to throw around, right? You only live once? That's right. We got to make a clean break from the things that we've been a part of and attached to for so long that's preventing us from moving on. And we got to make a radical cut, a radical break, a radical separation and not be afraid. We got to be more Pleasers of God instead of people. I don't know, John, if we've got time, but we got the 12 indicators of spiritual growth. Listen, it's interesting here. I was sent this by one of our members. One of our newest members, too. By the way, uh, this is what's so good about growing the Lord. You've got to get fun. 
He sent this to me on text. He sent me a lot of these quotes. But this has 12 indicators, I like number 12, 12 indicators of spiritual growth from Jonah by this guy named Mark Garber. Anyway, a life that is growing spiritually, number one, is one, is moving toward God's commandments, not away from them. Wow. That's a good one right there. Number two, shows a consistency between words and works. Number three, exhibits a testimony to the non-believing world, not the other way around. Number four, acknowledges and responds to the grace of God. Number five, knows what applies to the Word of God. Knows what applies to the Word of God. Six, confesses sin on a regular basis. Not pious words of religiosity. Number seven, responds to God in total and true obedience. Number eight, responds to God in humility, not arrogance and pride. Number nine, loves the unlovely and pursues them. Number ten, strives to love as God loves. Number eleven, evaluates one's heart and removes that from tender service or perspective. Be mindful of the visual of the hair cutters and the clippers. Twelve is concerned about people, not things. We care about people more than things, prizes, possessions, and all the above. Let's pray. God, I know it's seven minutes after twelve, but it's on your time. We all come here at a certain place in our faith. And so we come to you with earnestness and honestness saying, including myself, show me where I am and show me where you want to take me and where I need to go and show me how to get there because we know apart from your spirit, we can't. And for a lot of us, if we're honest, we've been struggling and wrestling and may even feel like we're dragging behind in some things. And so Father, show us how it's time to, to wake up. America needs to wake up. It's time to get spiritual. If we're going to see revival break Fourth, And I believe there are a lot of prophets that are predicting that um, revival will happen at some point. I'm praying sooner than later. I'm praying, Father, that each of us embrace Psalm 19.7 that says, Let the perfect instructions of the Lord revive my soul. God, wherever we're at, if we need to come and give our life to Christ, accept Jesus as our Savior, for the first time, because we've never done that, may we do that today. If we come, Father, in need of more discipleship, whether it be joining a Sunday school class on Sunday mornings that are offered and the teachers are so diligent in preparing those lessons for such to take the place, then may we join a Sunday school class or Wednesday night or an upcoming small group. Whatever it is, whatever it is, if we need to recommit our life, if we need, Father, to tithe, we don't have to tithe our spices and our herbs. We just need to be mindful, Father, of your blessings and to return and say thank you for the strength and ability you give us. Father, we just come this morning asking your spirit to speak and move, to have the freedom to move in any way you want. May that always be given here, the freedom to move in any way. Father, we come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This so old stand, we'll sing the old rugged cross. And the, the altar's open. I know it's coronavirus and we're trying to keep our distance, but it's big enough.
remind you, um, 25 strong church members, very signature, very signature, strong enough to come tonight, be a part of this church, to invest what we need you to invest, because we need 25 people to make a decision. And so um, I'm going to encourage everyone to wear a mask, so we can't use that excuse, and I didn't want to come because of someone wearing a mask. So I'm going to encourage everybody to wear their mask tonight. At least we sit down. You know, because we want people to feel comfortable that if that's the reason we're not coming, um, that we're going to do that. We're going to abide by that. So I want to do my part in encouraging that. So wear your mask when you come in so you can see us. Um, so that, that would keep others from saying that they're come. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to ask. All right, so 25 people. I hope we have 25 good church members here so we can come on. Yes, sir. Um, Bob, do the closing word of prayer. Well, Father God, we pray that you would leave this place spirit would be with us, Lord, that we would go out of this place to be God pleasers and not people pleasers. Mm -hmm. That we would not cause now to always be corrupt against us in our day and time to get through the work of all your purposes. To be with each one that's here, Father God, guide them, guard them, love them as only you can. And to give you praise and glory and 